Hello. So I'm Gabe Friedman. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Financial Post Safety Net panel sponsored by MasterCard. Today, the issue is cyber attacks. All the data suggests that cyber attacks are growing. It's kind of a sleeper issue for business and the economy because it doesn't get as much attention as ESG, climate change, the energy transition, inflation, all these other issues. But we know it's a major cost for a growing number of companies. And it affects the largest companies in the world. And it also affects the smallest mom and pop shops, hardware stores, bakeries, et cetera. So it's a super fascinating issue to watch from both a technological perspective and from a social political lens. We have about an hour to discuss cyber attacks and what's happening and what the solution is, draw a circle around it, serve it up to the local authorities by all accounts. That's more than enough time, but we have to get started. So we're going to start with a big topic. In Canada, as I've said, we've seen cyber attacks on all manners of businesses, but also on what could be called critical infrastructure, healthcare systems, hospitals. It happened to an energy pipeline in the US that certainly affected Canada. And on a global scale in the past, we've seen attacks on giant shipping companies that have caused massive disruptions to international trade. At the same time, many of these attacks so far have fallen below the threshold that would trigger the international alarm bells and cause top leaders in government to say, okay, this is an act of war. This is cyber warfare. So Ali, maybe I can start. Maybe I can start with you. I know you have thoughts about sort of how these attacks are designed. Is it by design that they're sort of not going as far, the actors are not attacking as much as they could. Right. Uh, well, you need to look into the tactics that actors are adopting in most of these attacks. You know, most of the adversaries, the countries out there, state sponsored hacking groups. Uh, are mixing or blending the cyber criminal activities to advance and build capacities for the cyber war. So, for example, we are saying that it is very common for state-sponsored hacking teams to join uh, their uh, efforts with known cyber crime groups to use their tools, for example, ransomware, to cause disruption while under the hood, they are testing some strategies that they can use at the time that is needed for the real cyber war. So there is a concept of the micro cyber war that are currently discussed significantly in the community that uh, you can always have a macro level strategy for your cyber war and causing disruption on different critical infrastructure. But if you want to test it, you need to run it at a micro level on a specific instances and then show it off as a way that it's just benefiting a specific hacking groups. So that's the trend uh, that we are seeing more recently being followed by several uh, state-sponsored hacking teams that uh, building capacities, identifying the strategies that could cause disruption, but then testing it on a very micro scale uh, to see whether um, that would cause the effect that you want to do or not. Um, so there is no way that we can coin a specific instances of the major attacks that come to the news uh, as a cyber war, because you're smaller and their uh, motion seems to be mostly directed towards the financial, for example, financial gain. But then when you look into it as a higher level, you see the uh, instances that the adversaries are trying to test their tools and see whether they can use it as an act of warfare. So overall, uh, we are seeing a more uh, mixing of the cyber war and cyber crime activities uh, for testing the cyber war capabilities. Uh, and that is that is going to grow as we are growing, connecting our uh, economies and digital infrastructures. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I would say these micro cyber war activities would be growing fairly quickly, everybody in the world. Interesting. Very interesting. So you said so many interesting things there. I can 
key in on about a bunch. But one of the things you said initially is that you see a sort of separation between cyber criminals who are maybe just doing this for money. I don't know if you said that exactly, but that's how I interpreted it. And then people who are sort of state enabled who might be or, or state affiliated who may be more interested in attacking a business for other reasons. Um, maybe I can just put this out to some other people in the group who have been on the inside of attacks. Have you been able to distinguish where the attacks are coming from? And do you distinguish between sort of someone who's just doing it for money and someone who's doing it for other reasons? Um, is there anyone out there who has that experience who's able to talk about it? I could probably go first. Um, okay. Yeah, so so the, the attribution is extremely difficult to find out where it's coming from, right? Because there's so many ways that they can hide their tracks. But we know that when it's, when, a, when a active um, a ransomware group launches a ransomware attack, it doesn't happen just overnight. They've they've pretty they've pretty much been in their system for eight uh, six to eighteen months prior to being detected, and when they're in there, they're in there doing reconnaissance to see what systems are uh, most valuable. Uh, what patches are missing? They're just trying to harvest credentials so they can they can do lateral movement, log into other stuff. They want to get gain a foothold into the environment, and during that time, they're going to start siphoning out your data. So this way, when they feel they got everything they need, they're going to execute the ransomware attack and lock everything up. Then they're going to hold you for a ransom. And at this point, you know they might ask for hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars at this point. And now you have to bring in the, a, a group that'll help negotiate the ransom. And if you are able to recover your data from, uh, from backup, um, then they can still hold you hostage saying, hey, listen, you're still going to pay up or we're going to leak this data all over the web. You're going to get hit with fines, penalties, loss of trust. It's, it's a mess, Gabe. It's a mess. Yeah. I mean, that brings up to a good question. When, whenever you see an attack in the news and you talk to experts like yourself or others, the advice often is don't pay the ransom because we don't know if we can trust these people. How often, maybe I, maybe I can ask, you know, some of the other, ask, ask you and for other people, do you generally tell your clients who are attacked to pay a ransom or to withhold it? You want me to go first or anybody else? Yeah, that would be great if you could go first. Okay, sure. So uh, obviously the, the, the rule of thumb is we don't want to pay the ransom, right? But the thing is, um, a lot of times companies don't have proper backups. They often get encrypted. They're not using like a three to one method where, you know, three copies of your backup, two of them are, are encrypted on site and one of them is off site. They're not doing that method. And um, unfortunately, the last known good backup sometimes is seven months ago. So now you're in a position where do I pay the ransom or do I lose my business? Right. Right. And go ahead, Ali. If I can chip in, um, we have seen that many companies are impacted, especially SMEs, a small, medium sized enterprise, are impacted by cyber attacks, are going bankrupt within nine months after the cyber attack. The correlation doesn't mean causation. But there seems to be a connection there, right? Uh, but so, so because I want to get back to your question that are we advising them to pay or not? Um, what we normally do, what I normally do when we are engaging with the clients is uh, make sure that we have the communication line open with the adversaries while we are trying to identify what are the options that we have. As Terry indicated, negotiating the ransom, trying to buy time uh, is, is essential when we are dealing and engaging with the clients to identify what are the best uh, sort of actions that should be taken on that specific case. And maybe I can jump in here as well on the SME angle. Um, small businesses are, um, business owners often are not experts in cybersecurity. So it's really important that small businesses take it seriously and, and really figure out how to prevent cyber um, attacks from becoming successful, but also having an incident response plan so that when not if, but when you're attacked and if there's a breach that you're prepared and you know what steps to take. So that can really help um, prevent businesses from closing down permanently um, when they are um, faced with, um, with a breach. 
If, yeah. And just to go back to the to the initial question a little bit as well, uh, what, what Terry was talking about when they said reconnaissance, the, a lot of the ransomware threat actors do understand their, the the target, and and they know the limits, basically the funding limits that the target is going to be able to uh, to maybe uh, sustain, because the harms are often more uh, more costly than than paying the ransom. So they know this, it's an extortion attempt, right? So they're looking at the potential harms and they look at the targets and they say, okay, well, we could, we could, uh, we could ransomware the, the organization or we could ransom the organization for this amount because we know that they could withstand this uh, and, and we know the harms are be going to be uh, first harder. So, so there, it, instead of it being a cut and dry decision is it not pay or pay, first of all, there's legal and insurance uh, advice that comes at you that you should be able to absorb. If you've got an insurer and if you've got uh, uh, you know, uh, in count, a general counsel available to you or a, uh, a lawyer available to you, they can help guide your decisions. But there's no cut and dried solution here simply because it becomes a business and it becomes a sort of a, a, a risk-based decision as to whether you're going to pay or not pay the ransom. Uh, when you look at the hospitals and, and uh, youth services and all these others that have been hit by ransomware, the costs, the harms associated with not paying the ransom were high. Now, there are risks to both paying the ransom and not paying the ransom. And I do want to get that clear. But often the, 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 the ransomware threat actors actually take, take the time to understand the organization so that they can make so they think that their ransom is basically on target, but the company will likely pay based upon the harms. So it's a it's really a human nature thing as well. Just to build that comp oh, sorry, Kathy, go ahead. Sorry, Terry, if I could jump in with with just two points. One is some statistics. Blake's um, sort of on an annual basis compiles statistics on sort of ransomware attacks that we've been involved in, but also collect information from partners who we work with in attacks. Um, and, and our calculations last year were that in about 56% of cases that we had data about, the ransom was paid. And the second point I wanted to mention, just in terms of the legal implications, is there, there is a sanctions check to do before, before paying a ransom. Um, and in particular, the, U, the U.S. has a regime where there can be strict liability um, for paying a ransom um, if, um, if you're aware that the wallet is associated with one of the sanctioned entities. So that's just a le legal consideration to keep in mind in deciding whether to pay a ransom or not. So that opens up a whole other can of worms, which is like you, the person who gets attacked, could face liability for paying to get yourself out of this system if you don't have a strong system in place. Kathy, you mentioned that you work at Blake's. Um, Mandy was talking about how small to medium enterprises, you know, need to take some precautions. It's a little different than a larger company. Blake's, you probably have some very large clients. I'm wondering what percentage of your clients have a chief technology officer or some other executive whose primary responsibility is to sort of guard against malware, ransomware, et cetera? And that it, of our larger clients, that would be that would be a relatively significant percentage. This is now such a, an important business imperative. We do find that our clients are taking very seriously the need to protect their systems. And also as Mandy, mentioned to have an incident response plan in place. Um, larger businesses tend to have a more comprehensive plan, um, but it's certainly something that businesses of all sizes um, should be keeping in mind um, because that can significantly reduce your legal risks and the costs of an incident if you face one. Yeah, um, and also you mentioned like 56% of some of the companies you've seen paid the ransom. So could you, did you, were you able to associate paying the ransom versus not paying the ransom with certain outcomes or what else can you tell us about sort of which fork in the road you choose to take? Where does it lead? Uh, and, and paying, you know, as Terry said, no one, no one wants to pay a ransom. It really, it, it really is a business decision um, about whether, you know, whether you have sufficient backups um, to be able to bring the business back online, whether those backups are clean. Um, so if the, you know, if they haven't been sufficiently protected, and as Terry said, in many circumstances, the, the threat actor has been in the system for months and may well have infected the backup. So we certainly have clients where the backups were also infected, 
um, or they didn't they didn't have all of the backups, you know, for whatever reason that they would need. Um, or as Randy said, you know, these are very sophisticated criminals. They have figured out where they're, you know, what what amount the client may be willing to pay. Um, that that does make business sense. And so certainly there are, there are circumstances where, as much as no one wants to, uh, no one wants to pay a ransom. There are good business reasons um, to do that. Um, and so that that I think really is the decision point for businesses. Um, one one thing to be aware of. Um, for people who haven't been in this circumstance before, is you can negotiate this ransom. I think for many businesses who haven't been in the position of this, that you know it can come as as a surprise that sometimes you can you, know, you can decrease the ransom by. I've, I've had circumstances where it was up to eighty percent. Um, we we negotiated down the ransom by pointing out you know various factors that persuaded the criminal to take a, a smaller amount of money um, in exchange for the decryption key. Well, wow. that, well, wow. that goes back to speaking what Ali was talking about with respect to keeping the lines of communication open with the threat actors. There's multiple other reasons, but that is certainly a reason, right, uh, to be able to uh, re renegotiate the the ransom, which is a very common occurrence nowadays, particularly if you have a savvy, uh, you know, uh, legal or insurer uh, breach coach that can help you. Another comment I always get is around cyber insurance. Whenever I talk to business owners, I have cyber insurance, I'm covered. <laughs> right. So they don't realize that if you don't have the proper protection in place, they can refuse your claim. And now they've, they, they're actually tired of losing five dollars for every dollar they're getting. Right. So they're making the, the requirements much more uh, stringent. So you need to have all these advanced uh, things in place, you know, the, the two step verification, uh, your employee training, log monitoring, all these things have to be in place or else you don't even qualify anymore for cyber insurance. So, wow. Um, go go ahead, Kathy. Were you going to say something? I think I was. Uh, was say something, yeah. oh, um, I think this conversation started in a really strong place because I can imagine any small business owner who is hearing this conversation um, can hear the um, the risks and how scary it can really be to be in that position where you're faced with a cyber breach. Like the example that Kathy gave, where even if you have backups, they could be infected themselves. And I think this really um, harkens the importance of prevention. And 95% of um, cyber breaches are a result of human error. And what that means is that it can be prevented. And that can really be done through cybersecurity training. Um, we've surveyed CFIB members and um, unfortunately the small business community, cybersecurity training isn't the majority in place. Only 11% as of last year had um, offered cybersecurity training. So that's a really important place to start because um, you don't want to get into the situation where you're faced with um, a, a, a ransomware attack. Yeah. I mean, that might be a convenient moment to pause for a second, because one of the things I've learned pretty quickly as a journalist covering cyber attacks is that, by and large, I think most people are, are, are a little jaded about this. And as a journalist, it's no longer enough to just describe simply what happened. You know, hackers got into said company and shut down the system, et cetera. People want to hear from victims. And... One of the issues is that victims often do not want to speak about this. Um, so I'm wondering, given that we have so much expertise on this panel, if we can do a little exercise and go inside an attack on business and describe what it's like. Um, uh, Terry, you mentioned that like a lot of times they're in there for six to eight months before they strike. Has anyone, I'm wondering, is anyone here able to sort of talk about kind of what it's like when they do strike? like? what some of the sort of day, how that sort of unfolds and and what some of the responses you should be taking or doing are. Okay, so it, and it happened a couple of years ago where one customer, uh, the poor IT guy, it was his fourth day on the job and uh, the-, the Is uh, it a the big rents, company, small company or? Uh, yeah, 400 employees. And okay. um, so, so they got in, they ransomed his environment and because they um, uh, didn't have any preparedness at all, 
They didn't know where the license keys were to any of the software. They didn't know where the install software was. So they had to try to rebuild the environment from scrambling. Um, all the computers were locked. So what was happening was once they were able to um, get some stability in some environment, the, the employees were double clicking the ransomware over and over again. So it was like re-encrypting the encrypted. So now what's happening is they were getting charged three times for the key. So, <laughs> so oh the, and the backups weren't working. The last known good backup was over nine months ago. So they had to revert from tapes. But now they had a problem where the, the, the server that was indexing those tapes was encrypted, which, which uh, scrambled the database. And it, 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 uh, it corrupted the database, which means they have to re-index all of the tapes, which could take weeks to do. And uh, we were able to help negotiate a ransom that was eight hundred thousand dollars down to like one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, but oh. it uh, it was crazy. And when you pay that, you're paying that presumably in some sort of. Oftentimes, at least it's reported as that is a lot of cryptocurrency. Was that a crypto a crypto correct. payment? It was. It was a crypto payment. Correct. Yes. Bitcoin, or do you remember what it was? It was in Bitcoin. Huh. Yeah. Wow. Um. Ali, you said you like to stay in touch with the criminals um, and communicate with them. I was just curious, what are you using? You're probably not using Slack. I don't know. Are you <laughs> using email? Where, 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 what sort of, how does that work? Well, there are forums and channels that are built that you're using for negotiation and communication, right? Uh, but getting back to your earlier question about what is happening, how the day unfolds, right? And I can share you a lot of stories because working with different clients, you know, usually the day unfolds with uh, getting a message or an email or uh, some uh, encrypted content showing on, a, on some of, I mean, a small portion of your network that the attackers are starting to tell you that they have access to your systems and they show, show you their capacities, right? And they usually start very small uh, because, you know, it's in the best interest of the attackers as well to just communicate with the right decision makers and get this thing sorted ASAP because they want to be paid, right? At the end of the day, most of them, they want to be paid quickly, right? And the cases may escalate uh, uh, if the company is not taking the right, is not calling the right person for the help if they don't have them on board uh, and not, uh, not, not managing the communication properly, right? Uh, the point is, uh, and that's what I always say, the moment that the company is seeing the first sign of communication by the attackers, even if the attackers doesn't look like to be legit, it is the time that you need to ask for help. If you don't have people on board, right, to help you, you need to contact professionals and ask them to come and help, right? Because those moments are important if we can evaluate how far the attackers have been in your network, what accesses they have, uh, what information they could exfilter exfiltrate if they could. That would change the way that we are communicating and negotiating with the attackers, right? Um, even when, as we are monitoring the dark web, sometimes, uh, I mean, one of the things that we see a lot is the claim of the attackers that they have access to the system so they come and say that i have access to that organization right and uh, there is even a kind of i mean the companies that are working on the instant response uh, have a kind of uh, build a kind of reputation system for these different accounts to use for communication and sometimes when you hear something from an accountable account you need to inform those organizations that an attacker X is telling us that they have access to your organization and their claim in the past was uh, credible, right, to take action on. Uh, but that's usually how gave the day starts, right, with something minimal, not shown that big. And, wow. and that's the time that we need to, the, the companies and the organization needs to take action. And maybe just to expand on like who, who you reach out to immediately. Um, it, the, the first call hopefully will be to a, a breach coach. So a, a, like a lawyer who has expertise in dealing with incidents. And that's in part because solicitor client privilege should apply to, to many of these communications. And that can that can only take place if, if a lawyer is overseeing those communications because you know, discussions within the company about, you know, about what has happened and what they should do and what their obligations are aren't privileged unless a lawyer is involved in those. And also the lawyer will have contacts and experience in dealing with these kinds of incidents. And typically the breach coach will retain 
um, an incident response companies with a forensic investigator to help, um, like some of the people on this call, um, to help on the forensics side. Um, you may need PR assistance, um, particularly if it's a circumstance where personal information has been stolen. And increasingly, we're seeing with cyber criminals that not only do they lock down the system, often they also steal data because that gives them more leverage to bargain for a higher ransom um, because it's a, a second reason, even if you have good backups, the company may still pay in order to get assurances that their employees or their customers' personal information isn't going to be released online. Um, yeah. And uh, you, you may also want to retain a, a specific ransom negotiator. But one thing to keep in mind is that if you have cyber insurance, they may have a panel of of people who are already pre-approved and you, you may or may not be required to use sort of a, a particular panel under your cyber insurance. So you'll wanna get your insurer involved very quickly as well, just to make sure that you're not doing anything that might limit the coverage um, by incurring costs before that you've reached out to the insurer. I just, right. I just this is, I so, to, uh, we'll talk in a second, but just, I'm, I want to interject here with a question because all this is raising someone someone emailed me this question and I want to I'm going to take a moment to ask it now because we're talking about insurance, um, you know, constant refreshing of backups, um, hiring breach coach, lawyers, negotiators, someone who has the technical capacity to sort of sort out your systems. Um, we've talked a little about the cost of these ransom 120,000 and how they're sort of calibrated to make it a business decision, um, how, if you're under attack and you're a business, like how should you be thinking about the costs of what to pay? I know as a journalist, one of the things that surprised me when I started reporting on this, I would talk to people and they said, it's very difficult for businesses to gauge what the correct market value is for some of these services because it's not the most, I don't wanna say it's not the most transparent, but it's new, right? Nobody knows how much to pay for backups. Nobody knows how much to pay for a cyber breach coach. If you're if you're a customer, I don't. Does, can anyone out there give some guidance on sort of how to think about the costs of this? Mandy, do you have you ever tried to assess that or any? Is there a rule of thumb or anything like that? I would love to be able to collect some of that information in this conversation to pass on to our, our members. Um, what I can talk about in terms of costs, um, we have asked our members what the cost has been to their business when they've had a breach, including all the costs that they've had to incur, time lost and everything. And on average, um, it costs typically $26,000 when there's a breach, but some of our members have reported as high as a million. Um, and we, we asked them to include all, all the costs that they incurred. So those services would be included in there. Wow. Wow. There's huge amounts of money being spent on this. So not, not just that. It, it also takes, when you get hit with a ransomware attack, a lot of people know this, it takes minimum of 100 hours to recover. So you're down for 100 hours minimum. At this point, none of your systems are working. You're still paying all your employees. Uh, you have to negotiate a ransom. So I've seen bills go from $26,000 to $2.2 million in less than a month. It gets, it goes really, really fast. So this is a question then from one of our audience members, which is, uh, you know, do SMEs, right? Let's just focus on SMEs for a second. Have any chance of becoming truly cyber secure with the spiraling cost of cyber experts and the rapidly evolving threats? Yeah, they absolutely do. Uh, so part of the challenge here is that, first of all, when we, I just want to briefly discuss costs because it depends on the business, it depends on the technological context, it depends on the, the attack. And you could actually do cost modeling against different scenarios to figure out roughly what this is going to cost you. And then that will give you, and, and it doesn't take a lot. You just need somebody who has a little bit of uh, financial background to do some cost modeling. But with respect to SMEs being cyber secure, they can't. Uh, there's a lot of things that they can do that are actually low cost, no cost, that that uh, that will allow them to be far more cyber secure than they are. Uh, Mandy mentioned the IRP, the incident response plan, just having a plan in place so that you can be resilient, so you can go through the incident, so you know what's going to be happening, so you have a process in place is helpful. Having permit or security, having, you know, make sure your endpoints or your 
your, your laptops, your uh, printers, your devices all have some level of security. Uh, training, like uh, Mandy mentioned before, you know, train your people on on what to look for and how to keep themselves safe, cyber hygiene. So there's lots of things that organizations can do. The, the fact is, is that it really, it's not happening at, at, at a pace that would, that seems to keep pace with the threat. Uh, it's a very interesting dynamic because it, it's not like they don't know that the threats exist. It's, it's a matter of there's other priorities going on in their businesses, particularly now after the pandemic. They're struggling to, some of them are struggling to stay alive as a business. So any kind of investment is sort of off the table until they get back on their feet. But what I'm suggesting is there's lots of things you can do at very low or no cost that doesn't, that doesn't take that. But the, the primary thing is to understand what their risks are within their organization so that they can pre at least protect those valuable things find ways to predict those valuable things. And I want to give um, any small business owners um, a place to start. Because I think in addition to um, being really busy, it's knowing where can I go to start even bridging this gap of knowledge. And um, we've spent at CFIB the last year building a free cybersecurity academy for small businesses. So they can go to cfib.ca slash cybersecurity and start learning for you, for you and your employees. And we have a template um, incident response plan. So you immediately have tools that you can start using to um, strengthen the protections in your business. Also okay, so that's like the CFIB website. It's, I guess, sort of a way for small, I mean, is, is there a way for small businesses to sort of pool resources? Cause this is pretty daunting. I think, you know, if you're, if you don't have a chief technology officer, et cetera, to try and like, you know, deal with one of these things preemptively? Sure. So in terms of pooling resources, um, CFIB does that to some extent. We have savings offers um, for our members. So um, we do have um, cyber insurance that includes cybersecurity coverage for, um, for members. So we pool it in that way. Um, and the building of the Cybersecurity Academy does that to some extent as well. But I think one of the challenges is that so many businesses have different needs. And that's been mentioned um, in this um, call today. So some small businesses um, who are not as connected and don't have sensitive information may not need the same rigorous protections as another that is in a, a sector that's more sensitive. Interesting. Interesting. Um, are, just well, to bounce off what Mandy was saying about the resources that are available, the Catalyst also has uh, simply-secure.ca. That's, that's free and it's open and it's online. Uh, the, Canadian Center for Cybersecurity has a Get Cyber Safe campaign, and they've also identified baseline cybersecurity controls for small and medium organizations. So, or these resources are there. It's a matter of how biz, small businesses a uh, find them, get access to them, and interpret them for their context that matters. And and so that's probably uh, a better thing to have a larger discussion within the different industries, different sectors about, okay, how do you make yourself more cyber secure? Okay, let's do this. Let's do a low cost model on how you can make yourself more cyber secure. We're, we're also seeing issues where the, I might get in trouble for this, but the IT guys that are on site are not cybersecurity experts and they're not advising the, the, the management team properly. For example, we've seen cases where the IT guy says that, uh, oh, we don't need to have an antivirus on our exchange server. It's going to slow things down. Next thing you know, they get hit with a ransomware attack and, uh, and all hell breaks loose. So the IT guys need to work with cybersecurity experts that will help complement what they're doing and vice versa, right? We're not there to take their jobs. We're there to help them. Because a lot of common, a lot of the time we hear business owners, oh, I'm, I'm too small to get hacked. No one's going to want to hack me. My IT guy has it covered. And we see often it's not the case. Yeah. yeah, I mean, something that's, I mean, that I find could be very valuable for small businesses is to make sure that the business values are communicated properly to whoever is responsible for cybersecurity or how they want to build a cyber strategy. Uh, Randy mentioned about the risk and everything, all the investment should be around about and linked to the risk. But the risks that are perceived by different people in the organization are completely different most of the time. And what I usually see is, and, and one of the reasons that the cost of cyber program goes like to the roof is uh, there are a lot of costs going to cybersecurity that are not addressing 
the real risk to the business. So organizations are just following what others have done that may not be even applicable to them. They just try to uh, say, I, I am saying organization is already spending, say, on prevent on technology and a lot less on people. And the other way around, they are already spending on people and then a lot less on technology. You need to know the nature of your business. Even your business, you have a high employee turnaround right? If your employees are coming and leaving very quickly, is spending on employee training is not a good advice, right? So it's not like something that you should always follow. On those occasions, maybe investing on technologies would give a better return on investment. And if it's the other side, which means your employees are staying longer, then it is time to think about like getting a better return on those technologies, right? But have the risk always in mind. And that could be the best question that the business owners of SMEs can ask anyone advising on cybersecurity, what exact risk that advice is addressing. If that cannot be linked to the specific risk, it's, not, it's probably not a good investment. Uh, that's 100% um, accurate. Like it, the, the biggest thing is, is to start with the business risks in mind, right? And, and so many organizations don't do this. They, they start putting a bunch of IT and cybersecurity solutions in place without truly understanding what assets they have, data, information, information systems, devices that they have, and understanding what they need to protect. And you don't need to protect everything. It's not, and, and this is part of the problem, is some of the language around cybersecurity is overwhelming to a small, medium business owner. They don't have that capability. And as Terry have pointed out, even their IT folks don't necessarily have that sort of depth of understanding. So let's get it back up into the business discussion. Let's talk about business risk. Let's talk about the cyber impacts on a business and then and let them make the decisions around where they need to allocate uh, investment. And it all has to start with an audit, right? A basic audit is going to show them where they are now, where they need to be, where they should be. We're seeing cases now where hackers are using lay of the land tools. So for example, they'll hack into the firewall, they'll get access to their Active Directory server. So instead of launching a ransomware attack, they're launching BitLocker, which is a legit tool and, and very popular EDR tools are not blocking this, right? It's not a ransomware attack, it's legit software. And next you know, they're, they're holding 400 computers hostage. Oh my God. We're getting some questions from the audience that are pretty practical in nature, I would say. Things about like, how do you get a decision maker buy-in if you're at a big company, say? And, you know, a lot of people take the approach sort of, I guess, maybe reflectively, this isn't going to happen to us. We don't really need to spend on that. And I think that's in part, again, one of the one of the reasons why it's so important for journalists and the news to like bring these stories up and, and tell stories of victims. And there have been some really good articles about that if anyone wants to read that. But how do you, what do people say? Like, what do you, what, what kind of training do we give to cybersecurity professionals? Um, and sort of how do you get people to buy in that they face a threat? So five minutes, if I may, one of the things that I, I, when I provide training to IT professionals, CIOs, CTOs, those kind of folks, it's about translating cyber risk to business risk. And, 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 and so that the businesses understand and they can't, the, the, there's, a, I wish I could remember the gentleman's name, but I was attending a conference and he called it the gap of grief. And it was the group, the gap between what business leaders are doing and thinking and what the technical community is thinking within that organization. So you need to bring them together. And the only way to do that is to stop talking about cyber in cyber terms and start talking about it in business terms so that they can understand what this is. And if you take the costs associated with any kind of cyber breach and lay it against the things that would have prevented that cyber breach, these often far outweigh the costs of the implementation of an effective security control. And so that's, that's the business case for cybersecurity. And I think that that's the kind of discussion that needs to happen. Okay. So one question I wanted to ask is, we're talking about this now, Ali, at one point you said you've seen studies that correlate within six to nine months, companies file for bankruptcy after paying these. We've heard about the costs of sort of hiring professionals to deal with this, as well as the costs of actually just paying the people to go away. We know it's a growing threat that there's more and more businesses doing this. At the same time, most of the report suggests that actors doing this, some of the actors doing it, are often out of reach of traditional law enforcement. Is there anything our government and other governments can do to sort of rein in this problem? Does anyone? 
Ali, do you have a sure? Take sure, I can start here then. Uh, well, first, I think every citizen needs to understand the nature of cyber world to just manage all expectation of any governing organization, right, including governments. Uh, you know, in the physical world, we have borders, we have some lines that we can protect. In the cyber, that doesn't exist. You know, when you are connected to any network, any public network, you are on, on the front, on the front line, technically, right? So there are a lot of responsibilities and actions that you should or should not take when you are there, right? Uh, I mean, when you go to the physical world, when you are visiting a new city, perhaps there are some places in that city that you do not want to visit. That's applicable to the cyber as well. And if you are there, you are exposing yourself, your business, and your organization to the risks that are applicable there. So what I'm saying is there are all that parts. And we should not forget that all this cyber and internet has been built to give us more freedom, more access, right? That's the nature of them. And if any government, and you know, we are having a lot of tools built out there to defeat the tracking, centralization, all those things, exactly for the purpose that we do not want to have a big brother monitoring us, following us, and tracking us. So that actually means that the expectation and what we should push the government to do should be considered in that lens, in that scope, right? If the citizens are pushing the government to over-regulate the internet, we may end up being like countries that are having 10 layers of filtering and then stopping many accesses that no one wants right, to happen. So my, my, my take for the government is just try to build the standards and build the guidelines, right? And the rest of it should go on the shoulders of the citizens, organization, and the businesses, right? Uh, to protect, to defend, and to detect, right? That's my personal opinion all the time when we talk about the government. We need to be very careful because if we uh, ask, I mean, we need to be careful on what we're asking, right? We don't want to be monitored or restricted that much on that environment as well. Yeah, I think some of that, uh, if there's over-regulation, it becomes red tape where there could be um, requirements in place that aren't actually necessary to, um, to um, protect businesses. Um, but I think where there is a role for governments is really on that enforcement side. Because the threat actors are international, governments do have to work with um, law enforcement in other countries. For example, um, the RCMP's new NC3 unit is now working with Homeland Security and um, other international agencies to try to track down and find the cyber criminals and bring them to justice. And it's not easy when it, it, it's across borders. Um, but what I would say is that where um, businesses, particularly small businesses, can play an important role in, um, in identifying those threat actors is by reporting your incidents to the RCMP um, or to your other local police, because the more cases that they have to assess, the more likely there's going to be some mistake that a threat actor has made um, that can allow them to catch the cyber criminals. Um, and so that is something that I think is an important role that government plays in um, trying to help stop um, the, the threat actors who are out there. Um, but I would also want to field a question to Kathy on that. Um, what is um, the typical recommendation or conversation you might have with a business owner around reporting the cases to the police? Uh, and and cl you know, clients end up coming to to different uh, different conclusions as to whether to report to law enforcement. But I, I've had lots of circumstances where we have um, and have found law enforcement to be extremely helpful, especially especially dedicated cyber units. So if you're reporting to you know, Toronto Police Service, there you know, or or you know to your local police service, they're overwhelmed with other priorities. Um, but you know, dedicated cyber units have a lot of expertise and they can provide you with some of the same kinds of threat intelligence that you might otherwise be paying a forensic investigator for. Um, so that, you know, that is one way of getting more sort of technical information if you're not able to pay as much for a forensic investigator. Law enforcement can help you in that way. 
Aren't and also they? just lag on the government side. There's a bunch of legislative reform happening now um, that participants may want to be aware of. So Quebec um, sort of recently reformed its privacy laws and there can now be quite significant fines for not reporting a breach. Um, there's also a cybersecurity legislation. So Bill C-26 um, has just gone committee to committee um, from the House of Commons, and that will declare certain systems to be critical and require them to have cybersecurity programs in place. Um, there's also reformed privacy legislation, so Bill C-27, that is before the House of Commons. And if passed in its current form, it could require fines for failing to report um, a privacy breach where there's a real risk of significant harm of up to 3% of global revenues um, and, and for offenses up to 5% of global revenues. So very significant administrative monetary penalties and, and fines. Um, so in terms of the question before about getting, getting buy-in to get for people to take things seriously, um, certainly those kinds of fines and some of that legislation actually even includes um, fines for directors and officers. So for example, C-26 includes the potential for fines of up to a million dollars for individual directors or officers for failing to comply with the obligations of that statute. Um, so there can be very significant legal risk um, if these aren't taken seriously. It's, in, it's, it's always stunning to hear some of these numbers. We have a great audience question I want to put to people, and it's, what is the panel's thoughts on proposals to make ransomware payments illegal in an effort to minimize the attractiveness and effectiveness of ransomware attacks? I mean, Kathy, you mentioned before that like you have to check and make sure that you're not paying someone money who's in a sanctioned place. What about if there were a law, what, does anyone have any, I mean, it, this is, I think sort of gets also to what Ali was saying about the push and pull between civil liberties and sort of that, that this sort of, these attacks raise. And unfortunately in current circumstances, I worry that that would have very serious unintended consequences, right? If you have, you know, if you have hospitals um, that are being ransomed, um, you know, have, you know, have no ability to provide critical services unless they pay the ransom, but at the same time are being told that it's illegal to pay the ransom. Um, I, you know, I, I do worry that we would end up in circumstances like that if there were that kind of strict bar against paying a ransom in all circumstances. And, for, and firms like ours would be in trouble for actually facilitate, uh, facilitating that deal. You know, they would come after us for, for, for helping the cyber criminals. But then again, do you want to, you want to pay the ransom, get your stuff back and, and get up as quickly as possible? Or do you want to lose your business? I think the harms yeah. often, uh, cyber criminals aren't stupid, right? They often re realize that the harms associated with the, with the release of the data or the release of the IP or the selling of the, of the source code or whatever the case may be is often much, far more costly to the organization than, than the ransom would be. And so you're what you're going to do is take the decision making out of the people who own the data or own the own at least the information or are the possessor of the information at this point in time and 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 transfer that and make it mandatory. The problem with that is, is that then you don't you're not taking into account the potential harms uh, associated with the with the uh, with the non-payment of ransom. It's really it's it's a it's a really uh, ethical it's an ethical uh, dilemma here, and and as Kathy pointed out, when you talk start talking about healthcare, social services, um, other types of uh, energy, energy, uh, any kind of critical infrastructure sector, if if all of a sudden that went down, and you're talking about public safety or public harms, was it worth the hundred fifty thousand or two hundred thousand or whatever? Right. So that's that's until we get a wrap on how to deal with these types of ransomwares, we need to be very careful. I think. Uh, and, about uh, about legislating uh, non-payment of ransom. And Gabe, I think those kind of legislation are just defeating the purpose. If I know that you cannot report me, or you cannot ask for help, I would ask for more money. That will give more advantage to the attackers, right? If you make it illegal, then what, that, what the attacker would do is they're compromising, they put the ransom over there, and they are sure that you cannot get any help because no one is there to helping you. Right. The, the thing, too, is that there's, there's actually technology out there that allows us to find out where these hackers are coming from. So, for example, we've been playing with some open source technologies since 2011, where let's say let's say um, 
we sent a cyber criminal a message saying, you know what, uh, we're having trouble paying the ransom. C can you just click on this link, check it out? Next you know, he's launching a ransomware script, uh, sorry, a, a, a JavaScript, which allows us to do a triangulation on his machine. So it does like a site survey of his Wi-Fi and it asks for all the neighbors in his area. So his neighbors are actually telling us where he is and triangulates him within five meters of his PC. We even have the capability of turning on his webcam, taking a photo and sending it back. But now because we don't have a warrant, we just violated a, a privacy law on our side, which could, which could throw a case out the window because it wasn't obtained properly. I mean, one of the things that strikes me about this, though, if your house gets broken into and the burglars are just staying there and just saying, hey, give me some more money, go empty your bank account, you call the police. The thing about cyber crime is that there is no, you can call a police unit, but as far as I know, it's not like, you know, when a big company gets hacked, there is no sort of government body that's like, okay, step back. You really have to hire private professionals. And so I'm wondering if you guys think that this area may evolve. I mean, the, the question was, if because if, if you had a government organization, you know, they could sort of, I think, police this, to use that word, a little better in terms of paying these ransomwares. At the moment, it just seems like we're in a spiraling trend where these are going up and up and up. And everyone's just waiting for something you know, big event to happen that reverses this trend. So, so I just want to assert now that the law enforcement in Canada is working on these problems, and they they have disrupted numerous. They have been involved with the disruption of numerous uh, cyber criminal operations, and particularly uh, one was just uh, Peel Police was involved in one just not all that long ago. It was advertised on CTV News about the, their role in disrupting an international ransomware. Uh, uh, scheme. So, so this is they are working hard at, at this. Of course, they're they're under resourced, like a lot of organizations are in the cyber domain. Uh, and there are uh, and there are government entities that actually keep an eye and watching on some of these things. And there is proactive disruption of criminal enterprise uh, going on. And so that that is happening. And and I think, like Kerry said, that the, the part of the challenge with us is we have to. We in the cybersecurity community and within the within the uh, Canadian law enforcement and government have to pay uh, due attention to law. The cyber criminals don't care about the law. So when we go to attribute or when we go to uh, uh, make an arrest or when we try to do something, we're impeded by uh, local local legislation and then the legislation in the country of origin as well or challenges in the country of origin. So it does become very complicated, but there's a lot of international agreements and work going on in that space. I just wanted to make that clear that there is there is some work going on uh, and the degree to which they're able to uh, do their job effectively is there's a lot of other barriers around some of those uh, some of those activities. And some of this part is also around attribution, right? How do you know, was this person behind the screen when it happened? How do you know it's not done at a coffee shop? Or how do you know this other person, the neighbor wasn't hacked and did the crime from mm -hmm. his computer? You know, there's, there's so much attribution that has to go on. It's, it's very, yeah. very difficult. Oh, it's, it's nothing if not a naughty problem that I think we're all here discussing because it's getting worse and worse. Here's a here's an interesting question. What is the biggest thing that cybersecurity professionals disagree about? Um, you know, I think the lay person may see this as sort of just a massive problem, but what are some of the big issues that people in this sector are grappling with? I would say it's resources for sure. They don't have the proper expertise that come in and help uh, these small businesses. A lot of time they'll say, well, I'm going to hire a cybersecurity expert. But some of these experts are $120,000 a year and they're not up 24 by seven. They're not, more, they're not watching over your system on a Saturday morning at 2 a.m. So they need to start looking at possibly managed service providers that can help them um, you know, monitor their networks and pointing clouds altogether. That's another problem too, is that a lot, of a lot of companies have too many tools that they're using and they don't often integrate together. So you need to have uh, services in place that can do this holistically. I like mm -hmm. just bouncing off Terry. I think making things simpler for businesses is, is, is far better. Having a simpler conversation, not getting the tech out of the discussion, right? Let, let, the, tech, let the tech tool and the tools uh, be driven by the business, by driven by the by the requirements of the business as opposed to being driven by the tech industry. So I'm a little bit, I, I, I'm really, you know, businesses need to understand how and what they need to be worried about uh, first before they start worried about how much money they're going to pour into cybersecurity. I agree with Randy. It's really about making cybersecurity more approachable um, so that 
everyone can understand what those risks are, what they can do about it, how they can protect um, their businesses better. Interesting. I would say there's a lot of disagreement at the sort of legislative and regulatory level about do we need more regulation or do we need simplified um, legislation that is more user friendly for small and medium enterprises, especially. Okay, uh, we have another. Uh, just one last thing uh, about this: what what can we do better? What we're having a problem with? I know there's a, a significant problem with the workplace and the skills and and people trying to become knowledgeable about cybersecurity and all across technical programs across Canada. And Ali may have some insights as well. There, there's not enough. Uh, foundational cybersecurity stuff in technical programs to actually inform those people. And we're still creating software developers, software engineers who actually don't know how to do uh, secure software. And, and so this is, a pro this is a fundamental problem with the people that are coming out of universities and colleges and the skills they're demonstrating around cybersecurity. I don't know if you That's saw smart. yesterday, oh, sorry. Uh, I don't know if you saw yesterday, Microsoft is, uh, is releasing the new AI program oh, for right. cybersecurity experts, right? Which is going to help that's us right. find flaws in software, and uh, that's going to be scary too, because that can also be used in the hands of the cyber criminals. You know, go hack, hey, go hack this company. <laughs> and actually, the AI is doing it. Yeah, I would say the security by design, if it can be incorporated during the design time and development time of many of the tools and the softwares that we have, that would help a lot. I mean, a few days ago, we have heard about weaknesses in the Chat GPT and what has been uh, released by that, right? Uh, so you could see that even those more advanced AI tools are vulnerable. And when I was talking with the AI developers, the security for them was the bottom of the list up until a couple of days ago that they saw that ChatGPT can be used to, I mean, uh, provide a lot of private information. So what I'm saying is that security by design could save a lot of attacks and of course, and that would be the best investment. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, maybe sort of rapid fire. I know we're almost out of time, but one of the themes that's come up a lot in this is you guys were just talking about chat GPT, artificial intelligence people know about. People also understand that a lot of our currencies and the way we use money is going digital. The internet is just everywhere. Quantum computing is coming. More and more stuff is going online. The trend seems to be this is getting worse. What... Does anyone, can anyone say anything about sort of what, when this changes, what the future lies, what lies ahead in the future, how we sort of interrupt this problem and bring, you know, sort of begin to curb this, um, this issue of cyber attacks and ransomware and malware. If I could talk just very briefly about quantum for a second, quantum computing is going to be a giant leap in, in uh, computing, computational power that will have the ability to, to disrupt or, or basically make uh, most of the public key infrastructure and, and encryption in used in business today uh, useless. And, and so, so we know it's coming. We know, we don't know when it's coming, but we're, we're, we're not taking enough measures and talking to businesses and telling them about this uh, I know there's a number of organizations in Canada that are really hot on this trail, but 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 businesses, this is this is fine at the financial institution level as an example, but smaller medium businesses don't have a clue that this is going to go on and, and the amount of investment they're going to need to do this. So let's be anticipatory. Let's let's start planning out. Let's start making sure that everybody understands what the context is going to be and what they're going to need to do it, and let's make it easy for them. Simplify the language once again. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That was a terrific discussion. I learned from every one of the questions that was asked and all the panelists. So thank you to the panelists. Thank you to everyone in the audience who attended, especially those who came up with such thoughtful questions. And thank you to MasterCard for sponsoring this event. I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you. And that's it.